Hello everybody. Today we're going to talk about important factors when considering an energy upgrade to your historic or vintage home here in the Northwest. When you have an audit done, what, what kind of materials do you get? What I want to do is, for example, if I take an energy audit, I should take a look at the utility bills, right? So oftentimes utilities oh. will help provide those. So the utility oh. bills give me a baseline for energy consumption. We can actually convert those into uh, good ideas about how energy is being used in the building. Because if your, your energy bill basically um, recognizes how the building is performing. So an energy bill gives us some information. I then do things like air tightness of the buildings. And people can go around and look in walls with a little hook, see kind of insulations okay. there they can look up in the attic and see that there isn't any <laughs> sometimes so we can kind of look around you can always tell by looking at a window if it's tired or single glazed so those are things an auditor is going to go on and say so you have single glazed windows we did a blower door test on your house and it was fairly leaky compared to today's standards probably three to four times as leaky as a new building um, we noticed that the insulation in your walls is probably pretty old we could read the newspaper so that was a tip in the wall yeah uh, and so you kind of walk around those you can see drafts in the in and, and are you comfortable and they might say no we're not very comfortable so you'd say, so based on those things, there's a few steps we can take. So you look at things like budgets, first steps, um, and second steps. So those are all stages. And I think if I was going to make a choice to fix my house, there's budgets involved, of course, yep. right? I mean, yep. as you know, you could walk into a house and spend $200,000 and significantly improve it and then break the poor homeowner. So they would want to make progressive steps. I think it's nice to start out with a plan and say over the next year or two that you might live here or beyond. These are some steps you could take to improve things and with a base notice of both energy and comfort as well as the kitchen, the bathroom you want to fix, and the bedroom for the next baby. Those would all be part of the plan, but you want to make it healthy and durable and safe before we make any other changes, right? Yeah. So is, is there like a tipping point? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there any way to be able to measure that tipping point if you're just doing insulation? And, yeah, and, it's a great question actually because in the early days of doing energy retrofits, we used to do a, use a blower door uh, that depressurizes the buildings. So you'd set a door in the front and you'd turn it on to see how much air you were sucking out of the building. People would run around with caulking guns and they would seal it up and the guy running the blower door would yell and say, stop! <laughs> and there was like oh. a magic point at which we thought that the uh, air tightness in the building with the air leakage was hitting. That was about 1,500 cubic feet of air under pressure. And now what happens is that we realize that Tidying up the building and adding ventilation. I can add ventilation for respiration, for example. I know that I breathe about 9,000 liters of air a day. That's my normal and human respiration. So if I can figure out I could put fresh air in, each, in the house at the same rate I breathe, that would be understandable and better. So people say, why would I want a tight house and then put in ventilation, why don't just leave it mm -hmm. leaky, right? Mm -hmm. So a leaky house uses phenomenal amounts of energy mm -hmm. and is uncomfortable in windy days and not very good in calm days. So we'd like to build a tight building, introduce fresh air just as it's needed mm -hmm. for the occupants and into bedrooms. I don't know if you've ever opened the door of a teenager's bedroom after they've been sleeping for 12 hours with a closed door, but that's not a good place to enter, right? So I wanna make sure that I put fresh air to where people live and sleep to really do that, and we do that intentionally. So I'd rather take an older building, seal it up well, put in a simple ventilation system that gave everybody just as much air You know, as this need. was impressed upon me a long time ago when I was a kid. I built a trap line cabin with, uh, for a trapper uh, back out in the Yukon wilderness. And when he came back into town after winter, he told me a story where he woke up in the middle of the night and he, and he, couldn't, he couldn't breathe. I mean, he was breathing, but he wasn't getting any oxygen. And he literally had to crawl to the door. I mean, he was, he could have died. And it, his, his wood stove used up all the oxygen. I mean, this is how tight we built this cabin. Right. And that made an impression on me, even to this day, sure. in thinking about sealing up homes, bringing in the air, thinking about the healthy air in our homes and how much of an effect it has on us. Very true. And, and I think it's also not just the air in the house. We have to be quite careful about combustion safety, as you said. So okay. yeah. those are the other parts of, of okay. tight buildings, right? You get cause and effect. So as you're doing this process, you could have an uh, auditor person walk with you through the whole, whole entire project, right? Could. I mean, could you do that? Okay. You could, yeah. So with a client, you could say, let's together go and look for air leaks by that you can feel it on the back of your hand you go boy that's a really big leak behind that pocket door so let's air seal the top of that door you look at it you go all those cavities are missing insulation so when you sit down you say looks like we know where the leaks are looks like we know we need insulation and where we want to improve rooms 
let's get started. And I think that's, you know, if you have an educated decision, it feels a lot better about the choices you make. And so getting your getting customers involved is kind of a little more fun now because uh, we have the tools to do yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, the technology is amazing it these is. days, actually. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything different about crawl spaces, attics, that we need to keep in mind? Yeah, of course, each one of them has their own challenges, right? I mean, a crawl space is pretty much a dirt floor with the, possibly the neighbor's cat who visits periodically. Um, I possibly have insects and even rodents in there. So you have to really watch crawl spaces. And remember, they're open to the outside in many places. So I've got my house sitting on top of this kind of dirt area. So crawl spaces contribute things to a building that are not as desirable as we would like. And a lot of uh, um, homes in the Pacific Northwest and other regions of the country that have crawl spaces actually seal them up a little bit to make them look like uh, and feel like shorter basements. But if we have a crawl space, we just want to make sure that we go in there and, and look. Are there gaps in the building? Are there places where rodents mm -hmm. are coming in? Those mm -hmm. are all part of the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want the air out of there either. Uh, attics are complicated spaces because there's either no insulation or there's even birds hanging out. I've been in attics with squirrels and things up there. So I think those are part of the challenge. So each space that you have needs to be carefully looked at in terms of does it have a contribution of a, a problem I don't want to exacerbate or something that I need to alleviate that problem mm -hmm. somewhere else. Great. Good. Awesome. Great Thank pleasure. you so much. That Good was awesome. You. Thank you, sir.